Thank you. Uh, if you have any trouble hearing me tonight, just give me a shout because I'm used to throwing microphones around and not holding them still. So, um, Before I start, I just want to introduce myself for those of you who have never met me, met me before. My name's Carl James, obviously. Uh, I'm a musician, singer, songwriter and musical producer. I'm also a full-time activity, therapeutic activities coordinator for the elderly. And I'm the author of the Truth Seekers Guide blog website. Um, I've written all manner of articles on there about all kinds of subjects. Uh, would be very familiar to the, the people here tonight. Uh, mind control, ufology, full flag events, 9-11, that sort of stuff. So, uh, I've also got uh, a book for me tonight, Science Fiction and the Hidden Global Agenda, which uh, ties in with everything that I'm going to be talking about tonight. They're £10 for anybody who wants to buy a copy. Uh, so tonight, I'm going to be talking about Stanley Kubrick, uh, a visionary filmmaker who enthralled cinema goers with his films for almost five decades. Uh, and unlike most of those people who've ascended the ranks of Hollywood, Kubrick was a man who dared to book the trend. Um, although he worked within a system that uh, regularly rubbed shoulders with the powers that be, um, many of his films were thinly veiled illusions uh, to some of the uh, dark mechanisms that exist in our world. Uh, it seems that Kubrick knew much about these mechanisms and may actually have been involved with them in some manner. Uh, via his films, it may also be that he actually attempted to expose some of these mechanisms, and that's all generally what I'm going to be talking about tonight. For those of you who aren't familiar with Kubrick, probably most of you will be, but these are his principal 13 films. He did a couple of documentary films before that as well and worked on other bits and pieces, but these are the films that he's predominantly remembered for from about early mid 50s till 1999. Uh, Fear and Desire, Killer's Kiss, The Killing, Paths of Glory, Spartacus, Lolita. Dr. Strangelove, 2001 A Space Odyssey, A Clockwork Orange, Barry Lyndon, The Shining, Full Metal Jacket, and his last film, Eyes Wide Shut. So it's principally what I'm going to be talking about in the first half of this talk is his connection to uh, NASA, the Apollo missions, moon fakery, and the idea that Kubrick may have been involved in some way. It's a popular and fascinating idea that at some point in the early 1960s, uh, Kubrick was approached by certain individuals and recruited to film, photograph, staged footage that would ultimately be presented to the world as the official account of NASA's uh, Apollo moon landings, as it were, I use them in inverted commas. Um, it's been claimed that his involvement ran somewhat parallel with the production of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover in the first half of the talk tonight. Um, yeah, and I'm also going to talk about as well where my investigation of this subject has led because it's been a bit of a strange road for me on this one because when I wrote my book I came to certain conclusions and I've now had to revise those conclusions but I will explain that as we're going along. One of the things that I wanted to get out of the way first of all is this, what I call this proverbial elephant in the room of this subject. Um, I've been on, the, on this subject with Kubit for about 10 or 12 years now and this was what I principally came across first of all. Um, cursory internet search of the Kubrick Apollo Fakery connection almost certainly threw up this bizarre documentary, mockumentary, some people call it, Dark Side of the Moon, a film by William Carroll. Uh, first aired on the Franco German TV network RT in 2002, not to be mixed up with RT as in RT news, under the title Operation Loom. The film presented the notion of Kubrick's involvement with NASA Apollo Fakery as fact. However, there are a number of factors that clearly indicate that the interviews contained within the film were either staged, faked, or cleverly edited out of context. And these are the uh, 20 principal characters in the, in the documentary who were interviewed. Um, what I want to try and do is eliminate some of them for a start. We'll start with these guys, seven characters here. If you look at the end credits of the documentary, you'll see that all seven of them are actually actors playing roles in it. They come across in the documentary as, as the parts they are playing, but they're not. They're characters. I've checked up on all the actors that in various films and projects that have been involved with, so we can establish that. What's also interesting about them as well uh, is their names. To anybody who's not that familiar with Kubrick's films, wouldn't initially pick up on this. There's an example of this chap here, this film director, who allegedly was involved with the CIA, called Jack Torrance played by David Winger. And Jack Torrance is actually the name of Jack Nicholson's character in Kubrick's film The Shining. This astronaut guy, Dave Bowman, played by Tad Brown, 
Bowman is Keir Dolly's character in 2001 A Space Odyssey, Kubrick's, another of Kubrick's films. All of their names tie in with either Kubrick's films or something to do with Hollywood. I just want to point out this lady here as well, Eve Kendall, is listed in the film as being Nixon's, President Nixon's secretary, and I'll establish why that's important in a minute. So we can eliminate those seven as being credible witnesses in the piece. Uh, the only actual references to Kubrick involvement with a moon plot, hoax, cover-up, however you want to put it, in the piece, are made by the aforementioned Eve Kendall, as I talked about, character. She's the only one, really, who directly talks about it as if it's real. Those who are interviewed with a connection to space exploration do not mention the Kubrick connection at all. Uh, we've got Buzz Aldrin here, the astronaut, um, David Scott, Jeffrey Hoffman, Farouk al Baz, who was a stalwart of NASA, still is, and Lois Aldrin, Buzz Aldrin's wife. Uh, they do respectively all talk about how groundbreaking Kubrick's 2001 film was. They also generally reinforce the opinion that man did walk on the moon, which is natural for these sort of people. So we can eliminate those guys, which leaves us with these. Uh, I want to put these two on hold for a minute. Christiane Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick's wife, widow now, and Jan Harlan, brother-in-law. And I also want to talk about this guy in a moment as well, uh, General Vernon Walters, former CIA deputy director. But before I do that, I'll have a look at these five, probably familiar for most of you. Donald Rumsfeld, Alexander Haig, Henry Kissinger, Richard Helms, former CIA director, uh, Lawrence Eagleburger. They're listed in the credits as themselves, obviously. Uh, at no point in the piece do any of them mention Kubrick whatsoever by name, do they discuss his films, or a cover-up involving the moon, NASA, the Apollo program, nothing of the kind all, all, at all. They're talking very generically in the piece, and their interviews have been carefully edited out of context. And a lot of people do actually believe that they are genuinely talking about Kubrick, but they're not, because this is where the interviews came from. The five men were interviewed by William Carroll two years before Dark Side of the Moon for a three-hour political documentary called Men of the White House. And it was first broadcast in three one-hour segments in 2000 on RT. And what I've done here, to give you an idea, is I've actually put a comparison between the two documentaries. On the left is uh, some footage from Dark Side of the Moon. On the right is some footage from the Men of the White House piece. It has been overdubbed in French, um, the men of the White House. You can hear what they're speaking about in English underneath. If you combine that with this as well, it sounds like something from the Muppet Show. So I've muted the sound on the men of the White House so you can just hear what they're saying on the dark side of the movie. You'll get the general idea. If you look at it, look at the backgrounds, look at the clothes they're wearing, look at the hairstyles, look at the general age of them. You can see that this has been taken from that original documentary. And I said, Mr. President, let's sleep on this. Because that's the job of a White House Chief of Staff. He had very great common sense. He was uh, a very uh, dedicated personality. He was in bed. It was late at night. Whether he had been drinking or not, I don't know. I don't know if he was thinking about it or not, but he didn't do it. He is impressive. And he is a, a balanced, rational man. And he also has some courage to say that. So you can see there, I mean, obviously I haven't been able to sync it up exactly what they're saying. But you can see from the backgrounds, they're sitting in the same rooms, they're wearing the same clothes. It's the same interview. It's the same interview. But there is something a little odd worth noting about this piece. Surely Kissinger and Rumsfeld, or the rest of the guys, they knew that their interviews had been reused for this documentary. More to the point, what for? And it's curious that they did not seem to mind, and have never since asked for a disclaimer to be added or for their removal from the piece. So you'd have to wonder why they haven't ever said anything about it. It's an interesting piece of plausible deniability that they're probably happy to have there, but um, nevertheless. And some other oddities as well. Vernon A. Walters served from 1972 to 1976 as Deputy Director of the CIA. William Carroll interviewed Will Walters in early 2002. It's possible that this footage was intended to be used in a documentary that I found out about, uh, that Carroll made, about the CIA. That particular CIA film was released in 2003. However, Walter's interview footage did not appear in that documentary. His interviews were concluded on February the 9th, 2002. Walter's died the next day.
To this day, his cause of death has never been officially verified. Uh, he was 85 years of age at the time, so he may well have died natural causes, who knows. And parts of his interview given in French, he was actually multilingual, he spoke about seven languages, I think, uh, were included in the Dark Side of the Moon piece. And in the film, Carol posits that Walters asked for the cameras to be turned off and that he warned that people would die if he spoke the truth. Perhaps only Carol and those people involved in the documentary knew what he was really talking about. It remains unclear what, what he was talking about. It may be that he just generically talking about his career in the CIA. Who knows, you know, they killed a lot of people, so perhaps that was that. And also the inclusion of uh, Kubrick's widow, Christiane, and brother-in-law, Jan Harlan. It's a strange involvement. Carol seemingly approached the pair originally to talk about his life and the films of Kubrick. Nothing to do with Moon fakery or anything like that, or Kubrick's connection for that matter. Carol claimed that he allegedly became fascinated with the idea that Kubrick had faked footage of the NASA moon landings during the filming of Space Odyssey and chose to make a parody mockumentary advancing the same thesis entirely in jest. He had the help of Kubrick's surviving family who acted as consultants for the film and gave scripted faked interviews. Now it appears that both Christian Kubrick and Jan Harlan uh, knew what they were getting involved with with this piece. They're both thanked for their cooperation on the end credits. There's a little screen grab there from it. Um, in the article More Than a Hoax by Henry M. Taylor, he claims that Christian Kubrick confirmed their involvement as just good fun. So make of that what you will. And so there's a lot of questions about Christian's involvement with that piece, which remain unanswered at the moment. But in truth, his piece is the most compelling disinformation limited hangout platform you will find on this subject, to be perfectly honest. It adds plausible deniability to the Kubrick Apollo fakery, they've got something to point at. And despite its very nature, it remains an off-sited source for a number of sceptics and believers alike. And I do have to wonder why people haven't looked more thoroughly at it and figured out what it is. And certainly um, plausible uh, deniability and limited hangout platforms do exist. We don't have to look at ufology, particularly 9-11, to see that these things go on all the time. So I don't think it's any different with this at all, with this subject. And another off-sighted uh, source has its origins in fragmented web pages from the early to mid-1990s. According to the Clavius website, the first mention appeared uh, I'm sorry, the first mention of Stanley Kubrick and his possible involvement in the Apollo cover-up uh, uh, actually appeared in 1995 on the Usenet news group. And it's actually untrue. That's their claim, but it's not true. As you'll see when I go on. Uh, I found much earlier examples of it. Um, it's worth noting that the Clavius group have dedicated themselves to sceptically debunking and dismissing all notions of an Apollo cover-up, so they're, they're far less than an objective source on this subject, so they're not going to give you something that's... Um, challenging your cognitive abilities. And the Clavius cited 1995 article is entitled Stanley Kubrick and the Moon Hoax and this, they allege, they allege, is where the hypothesis began. It says, in early 1968, Mr Kubrick was secretly approached by NASA officials who presented him with a lucrative offer to direct the first three moon landings. Initially, Kubrick declined as 2001 was in post-production at the time. But NASA sweetened the deal by offering to allow Mr. Kubrick exclusive access to the alien artefacts and autopsy footage from the Roswell crash. NASA further leveraged their position by threatening to publicly reveal the heavy involvement of Mr. Kubrick's younger brother, Raoul, with the American Communist Party. This would have been intolerable embarrassment to Mr. Kubrick, especially since the release of Dr. Strangelove. Kubrick finally relented and for 16 months he and a special effects team led by Douglas Trumbull worked in a specially built soundstage in Huntsville, Alabama, creating the first and second moon landings. This effort resulted in hundreds of hours of 35mm and footage, video footage of the Apollo 11 and 12 missions. So in a nutshell, the piece claims that the astronauts were launched via the Saturn V rockets into Earth orbits for several days and Kubrick's footage was broadcast to the world as from the moon. And then the astronauts came back, presumably. But there are many things wrong with this. Putting aside the obscure references to the Roswell incident for a minute, or the fact that Kubrick's footage was allegedly flawed and that he was asked to go to the moon for real and reshoot it, or that he declined because he said he had a fear of flying, 
Uh, the article claims that Kubrick worked on Apollo 11 and Apollo 12, but declined working on Apollo 13. The article then cites a director called Randall Cunningham as responsible for faking Apollo 13. In an article entitled Lunar Lunacy, Cullet Bancroft made this astute and slightly amusing observation. Randall Cunningham, never heard of him, can't find him on the internet movie database, but sounds like Richie Cunningham, who was played by Ron Howard in Happy Days, who directed Apollo 13, the 1995 film, not the 1970 mission, I think. It's also worth pointing out as well that Kubrick never had a brother called Raoul, he never had a brother at all for that matter, let alone one who was involved with the Communist Party. But what's particularly interesting as well, in this period where I was talking about limited hangout in the 90s, some researchers who are actually quite credible researchers on this subject were quoting the Raoul brother as being real. They clearly hadn't gone off and done their research properly and found out. It's not, an, not a hard job finding out that Kubrick never had a brother called Raoul, so interesting that they didn't uh, pick that up. So in the midst of all these vagaries and muddling disinformation, I decided that if I was ever going to get to the bottom of this subject, I needed to find something more quantifiable, something, some, something more substantial. I needed the source of the Kubrick fake tick concept. I'm not sort of out on this mission to sort of, you know, prove any theories or anything like that. I just, I knew it was around, I knew this idea was around, but I needed to find the earliest instance, instance of it. I needed to find out how fully it had been articulated, when, where, or by whom those words, Stanley Kubrick and Moon Hoax, were first spoken or written in the same sentence. And I knew that if I could find that out, it would tell us a lot more about this subject. So that led me on my little quest to find the Kubrick connection. <laughs> and like I said earlier, in my book, I unwisely came to this temporary conclusion that the Kubrick Apollo Bakery connection pretty much began around the mid, I, I bought into it hook, line and sinker, the sinker this uh, limited hangout, that, that it began in the early mid-1990s. That there was scant available data before that period, but I was wrong on both counts with that. I now realise, as I said, that there's a disinformation limited hangout platform there. Articles had been written that contained wild speculation, poorly researched information, and in some cases outright lies, and it led me to wonder why this was going on. I realised that if it was going to find more reliable and trustworthy data, it would probably be found outside of the internet. And the reason why I did that was because you can get hard copies of things, paperback books, you can date them, documentaries, things like that. It hasn't been messed with in the same way that stuff on the internet may, may have been. So I began looking at past documentaries, TV shows and films with any connection to either Kubrick or NASA's Apollo programme. On 25th of February 1997, a number of Apollo host researchers appeared as guests on John Ronson's Channel 4 discussion show, For the Love Of. Some of you might be familiar with it. This one particular episode was called Lunar Conspiracies. The guests were David Percy, Mary Bennett, Barry Reynolds, Matthew Williams, Andy Thomas and Marcus Allen. It's coming here so shortly. <coughs> the guests predominantly discussed the then prevailing evidence of the Apollo cover-up. At one point, Percy discussed the scene in the James Bond film, Diamonds Are Forever. And I'm just going to play you a little short clip from, from the interview now so you can see what they're sort of talking about. It's a James, James Bond movie. movie. And people say, what's that scene doing in there? He, he walks into this lab and uh, they're going to the moon. And he says, I've come to inspect your radiation shields. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's and the next thing he does, he walks out of the lab onto a moon set with astronauts mm. poncing around and phony backgrounds to it. And a studio. That's right, it's a complete it. studio. I, I, I remember, remember this And he ends up yeah. you know, being chased out of this set. Leaping so you have a connection and rushing off. in a James Bond movie of a lunar set and a statement just prior to it that says, I've come to inspect your radiation shields. Now, isn't that interesting? Mm. And these movies were, were made for a purpose then? Well, the, the, certainly the, all movies are made for a purpose. One is to entertain, two is to make a lot of money, or possibly the other way around. Uh, one is a product of the other. But, but are they also made for, for yes. a slightly more sinister purpose? I, I don't think James Bond is made for a sinister purpose. I think we have a, um, possibly, there was a Zeitgeist in artists that they're going to pick up the general energy of what's going on, and scriptwriters who are very close to the edge of things are going to incorporate into all work, as anybody does, a painter, writer or whatever, uh, the, their caring about things. And as you know, in repressive societies, um, you can get a lot said in fiction or in entertainment that you can't actually say 
straight out. And just because America is not labeled a communist society does not mean to say either that it's a democracy. But in some cases, you can have a situation where things are done to confuse. That's interesting that he actually says that at the end, David Percy. Things are done to confuse. Yeah. And I do wonder about that, given the nature of the subject, and given that they were also discussing the Hollywood connection. They talk about Independence Day at one point in it. I'm very surprised that Kubrick's name wasn't mentioned at least once in the show. It isn't, by the way. Um, it's possible that he was discussed, but this subject never made it to the final edit. Alternative knowledge researchers have participated in conspiracy hit pieces for the mainstream media, have regularly described how they've been interviewed on occasions for hours, and uh, practically only a couple of minutes have made it into the final programme. So, um, you know, it could have been discussed, it could have been discussed. But the host and producer of the show, John Ronson, is on record as being a lifelong fan of Kubrick. He's written numerous pieces about the filmmaker, and even made a film about him called Stanley Kubrick's Boxes, where he was granted exclusive access to the vast Kubrick archive housed on the family estate. And he also conducted an extensive interview with Christian Kubrick for the Guardian newspaper in uh, August 2010. Ronson should have jumped at the chance, I would have, if it had been me, to incorporate Kubrick into the discussion. So why didn't he? Some researchers have pointed out a number of oddities about Ronson. His book, The Men Who Stare at Goats, did much to model subjects like state-sponsored uh, remote viewing, psychic warfare, psychotronic implants, that sort of thing. Richard D. Hall, uh, Rich Plant TV host Richard D. Hall, also co accumulated strong circumstantial evidence uh, that he was uh, um, sorry, connected to or an asset of British military intelligence. And the details of that can be found in his article, uh, MI5 Exposed, and his excellent documentary, uh, Crop Circles, The Hidden Truth, if you want to check that out. But there's a, quite a, a wealth of information there that connects to Ronson. So we discuss in the episode uh, of For the Love of, Diamonds Are Forever, 1971. Just summing it up, while investigating the Nevada desert, James Bond, Sean Connery, finds it necessary to make a hasty exit, finding himself in an artificial moonscape, complete with trainee astronauts. You can see a picture of it there. Uh, Bond dashes for a nearby moon buggy vehicle and crashes out of the centre and into one of 007's film's most famous uh, film chases. The designs on the film, as with many, <coughs> excuse me, as with many James Bond films, were conceptualised by Oscar-winning uh, production designer Ken Adam. Adam famously designed the war room in Doctor uh, Doctor Strange, or Kubrick's Doctor Strange, or picture at the bottom there. He was a close friend of Kubrick and worked on Dr. Strangelove and Barry Lyndon. And when Kubrick approached him to work on 2001 A Space Odyssey, he declined. He said, I found out that I, I, sorry, I found out that he had been working with experts from NASA for a year on space exploration, all that sort of thing. And the moment I saw that, I thought, not for me. Because I could only function properly with this very powerful computer-like brain of Stanley by knowing as much visually about the subject matter as he did. Perhaps then I could justify departing from the visual reality that he knows. It's odd that he wouldn't have wanted to work on that film. It would have been a treat for somebody like him. Uh, NASA has a long history of cooperation with Hollywood, but it's usually vanilla. Uh, they've generally avoided supporting Hollywood productions that cast the agency, or any agency that has a sort of fictional resemblance to NASA in an unflattering light, or as part of any kind of cover-up. Strangely, though, there have been one or two exceptions, notable exceptions. The plot of the 1969 uh, movie Marooned involved a manned mission to the moon going wrong. Although there is no cover-up inherent in the plot, an alleged early draft of the script called for a smokescreen story created to perpetuate the notion of a heroic attempt to rescue the astronauts should they have perished. The film received full support from NASA including the use of Cape Kennedy for interior and exterior location filming. And the Apollo command module used in the making of the film was actually the boilerplate version of the Block 1 Apollo spacecraft as well. So there's a sizable degree of support there. Capricorn 1, as we talked about, 1978, features a plot that utilised Hollywood trickery and gimmicks to fake the first manned mission to Mars. In the film, the astronauts' crew are removed from their rocket and driven to a film set in the desert to record fake footage of their planetary touchdown. And that film, oddly, also received full support from NASA. Lazarus, Paul 
uh, N. Lazarus III, the producer of the film, had a good relationship with the space agency from the film Future World, sequel to Westworld, I believe. Uh, the filmmakers were thus able to obtain government equipment as props, despite the negative portrayal of the space agency, including a prototype lunar module. The film was directed by Peter Hyams, who would go on to direct uh, 2010, which was a sequel to Kubrick's 2001, and that film also had full support from NASA. So Kubrick and the establishment, he had disdain for the establishment, and you can see that in his early films, especially if you watch a film like uh, Paths of Glory, you know, the whole idea of the military-industrial complex, and, and Dr. Strangelove as well. And that film was a definitive satire of the military-industrial complex. Kubrick allegedly approached the military to be involved with the production, but the proposed tone of the script did not go down well with them, and support was refused. Kubrick had to use unorthodox methods to realise various aspects of the film, including the interior of the B-52 bomber in the film. This is a short clip from Inside the Making of Dr. Strangelove, a 40th anniversary special edition DVD, where they talk about uh, the problems that this may have caused. Adam and his team must also create a set of the interior of a B-52 bomber with no cooperation from the US military. I found a book called The Strategic Air Command by Mel Hunter. And on the front of it had the one picture which we desperately needed was not a very good picture, but a picture of the interior of the B-52 cockpit. And that was our starting point. We then had to really invent everything from then on. Peter was brilliant. And because I more or less handed that whole interior over to Peter, and he spent hours and hours on switches and morning lights, which fascinated uh, Stanley. Merton's designs are realistic enough to cause concern in unexpected circles. The publicity people invited some American Air Force personnel to, to look at the shooting we did, and they literally went white when they saw the inside of the B-52 because they said it was absolutely correct even to the little black box which was a CRM. So the next day I got a memo from Stanley. He hopes that I've got all my research from legal sources or from justifiable uh, sources because otherwise I and he could be in serious trouble uh, with a possible investigation by the uh, FBI. Kubrick uses a series of models to simulate the B-52's flight toward the Soviet Union, but back projection footage is needed to create the illusion of flying at high altitude. A second unit is dispatched to the Arctic Circle. Um, after Dr. Strangelove, Kubrick immediately set to work on 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, NASA was extensively involved with the production from the beginning. Sources vary on the exact date of the production began, but it's believed to be circa late 1963, early 1964. Kubrick's key NASA scientific advisors on the film were Frederick Ira Ordway III and Harry Langer. Ordway was a former member of the American Rocket Society, space scientist and author of technical books about space flight. He worked with ballistic rockets until 1960, followed by three years at Marshall Space Flight Center. Langer was an illustrator and designer for aerospace industry, and the head of NASA's future project sections, illustr illustrating the ideas of Werner von Braun's team, such as nuclear propulsion, space stations, and place, space platforms. And there's a picture of one of the books there that they worked on. There's also the two of them there on the production of 2001. Now, according to Ordway, it was Arthur C. Clarke, the famous six, uh, science fiction writer and the co-writer of the film Screenplay, who was responsible for Ordway and Langer and their involvement in the film. Clark had extensive connections with the upper levels of NASA, including close friendship with former Nazi and NASA rocket scientist Werner von Braun. According to the researcher and author William Lynn, in August 1949, von Braun was made an honorary member of the British Interplanetary Society through his friend Arthur C. Clarke. There's a picture of the two of them there together. Clark was also the chairman of the, sorry, chairman of the society from 1946 to 1947 and 1950 to 1953. He was a radar instructor with the Royal Air Force during World War II and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in 1948 from King's College London. So he's well in with the establishment. 
NASA's influence over the film became so pronounced that senior Apollo administrator George Mueller and astronaut Deke Slayton visited the set on September the 25th, 1965. I've been able to narrow that date down. It's actually not well documented. Uh, after seeing the myriad of hardware and documentation being used, Mueller nicknamed the film's production facilities at Borenwood as NASA East. So they took it very seriously. As uh, Ordway and Langer pictured with uh, Slayton and uh, Mueller there. Ordway and Langer created an elaborate network of establishment and industry connections to assist production of the film. In his piece 2001 A Space Odyssey in retrospect, Ordway explained, we relied heavily on advice and material provided by, the, by NASA and by a, a considerable number of private companies and universities. I found myself visiting General Electric's Missile and Space Vehicle Department near Philadelphia on the Discovery Propulsion, the Bell Telephone Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey on Deep Space Communication, the Whirlpool Corporation in Benton Harbor, Michigan on food equipment to be used aboard the Orion 3 and Ares 1B vehicles in the film, uh, Honeywell Incorporated in Minneapolis on a variety of vehicular controls, and IBM in Armand, New York, and its Elliott Noise contractor in Connecticut on all of our computer sequences. Cooperative arrangements made from the New York base were later continued throughout production of the MGM British Studios in Borenwood in England. So it was an extensive, extensive, uh, extensive de degree of connection there. And the plot of the film involves a clandestine cover-up to hide the discovery of an extraterrestrial artifact called the Tycho Monolith on the moon and a subsequent mission to the planet Jupiter with a secret agenda. Early in the film, a cover-up story is perpetuated about the spread of a fictitious virus prompting the quarantine of a lunar base. Uh, in the book, Conspiracy Theory in Film, Television and Politics by Gordon, Gordon B. Arnold, he explains that although it is often understated in the story, many central themes of 2001 are steeped in conspiracy. The script coolly paints a picture of government that feels little obligation to inform its citizens about a potentially history-changing discovery. This secrecy is explained away by the claim that public awareness could lead to panic. To a lesser extent, it also implies that there might be security reasons for keeping knowledge of the mystery object's discovery a secret. And you see that in the dialogue of the film. They talk about uh, opposition to the cover story, cultural shock and social disorientation. It's easy to check that out in the film. So. I'm talking about back projection, front projection, that sort of thing. Uh, ever since the first images were generated for the Apollo 11 missions, there have been many researchers who have recognised that the anomalies contained within NASA's Apollo film and photographic footage bear a similarity with the limitations of various Hollywood filmmaking techniques of the time. A similarity has also been drawn with uh, Kubrick's techniques. Uh, researcher Jay Widener in his film Kubrick's Odyssey compared the front projection process used so successfully in the Dawn of Man sequence of the film uh, with some of the abnormalities identified in the Apollo footage, such as the clear lines of definition between the rough foreground and the smooth background. I must point out that Widener's views on this idea of man on the moon have shifted widely over the years. And this, at this point in the film, uh, he didn't actually suggest that the moon landings never happened. But the one thing he has always remained consistent about is that the images of the world saw were faked. So I'm going to play you a, a clip now from um, Kubrick's Odyssey, this film, so you get an idea of what he's, what he's talking about with this the similarities. Front screen projection is a cinematic device that allows scenes to be projected behind the actors so that it appears in the camera as if the actors are moving around on the set provided by the front screen projection. The process came into fruition when the 3M company invented a material called Scotchlight. This was a screen material that was made up of hundreds of thousands of tiny glass beads. These beads were highly reflective. In the front screen projection process, the Scotchlight screen would be placed at the back of the sound stage. The plane of the camera lens and the Scotchlight screen had to be exactly 90 degrees apart. A projector would project the scene onto the Scotchlight screen through a mirror and the light would go through a beam splitter which would pass the light into the camera. An actor could stand in front of the Scotchlight screen and he would appear to be inside the projection. None of what you are seeing in the eight man scenes at the beginning of 2001 was actually shot outside. The scenes that surround the eight men in 2001 are actually slides of a desert being projected onto the Scotchlight screen standing at the rear of the set. As part of the trick, it becomes necessary to place things in between the screen and the set to hide the bottom of the screen. I have photoshopped a line differentiating the set and the background Scotchlight front projection screen. Please note how everything is in focus. 
from the pebbles on the ground in the set to the desert mountains beyond. Let's examine a few NASA Apollo images now. This is a still from Apollo 17. This is also a great example of the front screen projection process. Again, I have photoshopped a line indicating the back of the set. One can see that there is a slight uprising behind the rover, which is hiding the bottom of the screen. Also notice that even though everything is in focus, from the lunar rover to the mountains in the background, there is a strange change in the landscape of the ground right behind my lines. This is because the photo of the mountains being used on the front projection system has a slightly different ground texture than the set. As we go on, we will see that this fingerprint is also consistent throughout the Apollo images. Here's another Apollo image. Now here is my version where I show the line between the set and the screen. Not all lunar surface shots are using the process. Sometimes the astronauts are just standing on the set with a completely and suspicious black background. The early missions, Apollo 11 and 12, used the front screen projection system only when they had to. But as the missions went on and they had to look better, Kubrick began to perfect the process. We should also consider the use of several super fast uh, 50 mm Zeiss lenses uh, that were allegedly used by NASA in the Apollo landings, and subsequently used in the filming of Kubrick's 1975 film Barry Lyndon. Uh, for many densely uh, furnished interior scenes, this meant shooting by candlelight, a feat difficult enough uh, in still photography, let alone with moving images to capture. For months, they tinkered with different combinations of lenses and film stock to make this possible, before getting a hold of a number of super-fast 50mm lenses. With their huge aperture and focal f uh, fixed focal point, uh, mounting these was a nightmare, but they managed it. And so Kubrick's vision of recreating the huddle and glow of the pre-electric age was miraculously put on the screen. Now the use of these seemingly rare and valuable NASA lenses, apparently there was only ever ten of them made, uh, has raised a few eyebrows. Uh, moreover, the fact that Kubrick was in possession of such equipment has further compounded the notion of his possible connection to Apollo fakery. It appears, though, that Kubrick acquired the lenses during the production of Barry Lyndon, they were sold to private parties um, by NASA after they were no longer needed. Additionally, the lenses were designed for still photography, uh, had to be extensively modified for motion picture filming. The fact, though, that Kubrick knew enough about these lenses to effectively modify them is interesting. Despite his obviously obvious technical skills, and he did have a lot, and his connections to NASA, uh, it's still quite a feat for someone who had never seemingly used these lenses before. So it's worth thinking about. As we come on to the, the Shining now as well, Kubrick's film, loosely based on Stephen King's novel of the same name, the story involves Jack Torrance, the winter caretaker of the isolated Overlook Hotel, who is driven to psychopathic insanity by supernatural forces. Although most of King's plot is there in the film, the message and emphasis is very different from the original novel source. Some researchers have studied the film and believe that Kubrick used it to somehow make a confession to the world. Uh, about his knowledge of the Apollo NASA cover-up. Whilst this is somewhat speculative notion, based largely on a collection of symbolic and narrative motifs in the film, there is no doubting that the film contains some form of subtly embedded code or cipher. There's no doubt about that at all. Well, there's a wealth of material on this, but I just want to take a few key scenes here and look at. This scene in the manager's office is curious. It's where Jack Nicholson's character, Jack Torrance, is interviewed for his job at the Overlook Hotel. The manager, Stuart Orman, played by Barry Nelson, bears a more than passing similarity to the assassinated US President John F. Kennedy, who swore that mankind would go to the moon. Orman is dressed in red, white and blue, the colours of Uncle Sam in the US, and wears a hairpiece that increases his sim resemblance to JFK. There is some resemblance there. It has been suggested that by a number of researchers that scenes between Orman and Jack are a representation of Kubrick's deal with NASA, if that happened. Framed in the centre of the office window is a statuette of an eagle. The bird also appears in one form or another at various points with, throughout the film. Jack Nicholson's character wears it on his T-shirt as well. Um, yeah. The Apollo 11 module was called the Eagle, and the mission patches featured the image of the Eagle. The Eagle is also used as a symbol of US political, economic and military power structure. It also features prominently in Freemasonry. Um, a number of significant NASA figures are documented Freemasons, were and are. Uh, 
documents of Freemasons. And you can find a list of key NASA Freemasons if you go to the uh, Grand Lodge of British Columbia and Yukon website. You can actually check it all out there. It's quite staggering when you look at it. Uh, and the scene where Jack sits at the Adler typewriter, he's filmed from behind. And above the fireplace in the Colorado, Colorado Lounge are huge paintings of Indian totems that perhaps resemble the Saturn V rockets taken off, maybe. There's a closer picture of it there. The Adler typewriter appears to change colour to a darker shade as the tone of the film gets darker. Scenic artist Ron Punter was instructed to repaint the typewriter by Kubrick at several points actually throughout the film. Kubrick was known for his meticulous attention to detail, so why did he want this to happen with the typewriter? In the film, Jack types, types all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy endlessly on the pages of the Adler typewriter. Certain researchers have suggested that a synthesis of the Jack character and his son Danny are a metaphorical foil, they're a representation of Kubrick himself. And in that regard, it's been said that maybe the lines typed on the pages could actually be interpreted as saying, Apollo 11 work and no play makes Stanley a dull boy. Adler, as in the typewriter, is the German word for eagle. Another eagle has landed, maybe. Um, remember also that via Operation Paperclip, German scientists and engineers were key to establishing NASA and initiating the Apollo space program. The German angle is further examined in the 2012 uh, documentary Room 237, directed by Rodney Asher and produced by Tim Cook. The documentary represents the notion, alongside the Apollo 11 cover-up and the genocide of the Native American Indians, that Kubrick's film is an examination of the World War II Holocaust. Now, it's been claimed that Kubrick took an interest in Nazi memorabilia and spent a substantial amount of time and money building up a collection. There doesn't appear to be an awful lot of evidence to support that claim, but there are some connections. Uh, Kubrick did have a connection to the period of history via his Jewish heritage, and also via his wife, Christiane, whose uncle, Veit Harlan, was a famous writer and director of Nazi propaganda for Goebbels. It's well documented. A key moment in the film that may connect to the Apollo program involves Jack's son, Danny. Danny's witness sitting on a carpeted floor of a hotel corridor playing with small toy vehicles. The toys are arranged around a hexagon shape that constitutes part of the pattern on the carpet. The shape is comparable, not exactly, but it is comparable with the Saturn V launch pad, the 39A. More importantly, the hexagon shape is intrinsic to the ritualistic Saturn worship belief system that was followed by a number of NASA and J JPL scientists. One example is that is Jack Parsons, but more on that subject later. Danny sits at the centre of the hexagon and he stands up from the centre of the shape. The picture on his woolen sweater is clearly visible. It's a white rocket with the words Apollo 11 USA on it. Danny walks from the hexagon along the corridor towards uh, a room with an open door. The room is room 237. In King's novel, the room was 217, but Kubrick decided to change it. Jay Widener believes that there is a significance to this based on the data that he claims was listed at the time of the film's production in the American Heritage Science Dictionary, which measured the Earth's average distance from the, uh, uh, sorry, the moon's average distance from the Earth as 237,000 miles, which could be well, room 237. Contemporary mainstream science measurements now list the Moon's average distance from the Earth as 238,855 miles. The key tag on the room, on the door of the room, is room number 237. Widener believes that a loose arrangement of these letters could be interpreted as the Moon room. It is interesting that when Danny exits room 237, he has marks on his face, the sweater with the Apollo picture on it, is torn, he falls silent, and he refuses to talk about what he's witnessed in room 237. So there's something symbolic, metaphorical going on there with that room. There's, as I said before, there's a wealth of symbolism in The Shining. It's been analysed in all manner of ways. I could talk about it for hours if necessary, but uh, if you want to look into this subject further, some key places you can look. Jay Widener's documentary, Kubrick's Odyssey, and Beyond the Infinite, Kubrick's Odyssey 2. 
The documentary The Shining Code 2.0, that's a great film that is, worth checking out. The collective films of Rob Ager, uh, Ager is it? Yeah, I'd never get that right. Dissect Kubrick's films in multiple ways and also a 2008 article from him as well called Mazes, Mirrors, Deception and Denial, an in-depth analysis of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. It's really worth checking that out. Another ex excellent article, Stanley Kubrick's Keys to The Shining which examines the film. Unfortunately, I don't know the name of the author because he's, he's listed as somebody called Lick My Web. So whatever his real name is, I don't know. <laughs> and there's a fascinating short film called The Sean Report as well, which examines 16, although some people claim there are more, identical audio markers that appear strategically placed in the first 48 minutes of the film. Some people say that it actually sounds like Kubrick himself saying the word Sean. Um, it's worth checking out that. Now, this goes back to my research on this subject. In late 2014, I was alerted to a 2009 RT uh, news interview with former Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov. The mainstream history books cite Leonov as the first person to ever walk in outer space, 1965. Now, in all my research, I was surprised that I hadn't come across this interview before. More alarmingly, I was baffled that more NASA hoax researchers hadn't mentioned it before. The interview's been around for five years. Bear that in mind. In the interview, Leonov discusses the collection, recollection, sorry, his recollection of the Soviet space program, and he talks about the official version of NASA's Apollo missions. He also goes out of his way to dismiss any suggestion that Apollo lunar missions were in any way staged or faked and slams anybody that doesn't believe that Apollo astronauts walked on the moon, etc. It may simply be that he buys the official story, the official version of the US space program. It could also be that he knows more and he isn't saying. It seems reasonable to suggest that somebody in his position former position would have had some insight into what may really have occurred in relation to the Apollo moon hoax. But that isn't all that he says. I'm going to play you this now. I want you to listen very, very carefully to what he says in response to this interviewer. The United States are often accused of not actually going to the moon and faking the images from there. What's your take on that? The rumour started when Kubrick's wife commented on her husband's work. She said that it was very difficult to make the film about Americans landing on the moon. Well, it is understandable. There are two ships left on Earth. One is at the Smithsonian Museum. It is not allowed to even take pictures there because the displays there are extremely valuable. And the second ship, the exact copy, is in Hollywood. So he did some of the shots there, things like landing, opening of the hatch, because otherwise viewers would not get the whole picture. So that's how the rumour about the landing on the moon footage being fake started. Two people even went to prison for false witness. That's a bit of a staggering claim that he's making there. So I need to confirm his remarks. He speaks Russian in the piece. There's an audio uh, um, translation, English audio translation overlay. Um, I have a friend who speaks fluent Russian, so I was able to confirm that he was actually saying what he was saying in the translation. There's only really two ways to interpret what he's saying. That either his words, or because he talks about Chris Christian Kubrick at the beginning, he's loosely quoting Christian Kubrick. But if it is the latter, when and where did she make such claims? She certainly never said anything of that sort in Dot Side of the Moon. I'm not aware of any interviews with her where she said anything remotely of the kind. So I just want to sort of recap this, basically what he says. That Kubrick allegedly utilised an exact copy of the LEM located in Hollywood and did some of the shots there, things like landing, opening the hatch, because other viewers would not get the whole picture. And I should mention that piece at the end there, it talks about two people going to prison for bearing false witness. I don't know what the hell that is about I and mean, where he's got that from, I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows, please let me know. But there are a few things to consider about this interview with Leonov. His remarks create the impression that Kubrick's alleged contribution was fakery, but that all the rest of the Apollo 11 aspects were genuine. We know that there is evidence to indicate that there is a cover-up of the Apollo mission. We know that there's enough of it out there, questions that need to be answered. So why then imply that Kubrick's bits were the only bits that were faked and the rest of the stuff wasn't? The specifics of this claim are totally absent from not only every official and unofficial count of Kubrick's career and his life for that matter, but also the research into Kubrick's alleged involvement in the NASA Apollo cover-up. No one has ever made such a specific claim before. 
If there is any truth to it, then why have no cinema historians, or for that matter, any moon hoax researchers ever mentioned it? It's five years that this interview has been floating around for. So what purpose does it serve? It could be peddling disinformation. It's quite likely that it's disinformation. His remarks would benefit the limited hangout platform that I talked about earlier. You know, it's a plausible deniability disinformation on multiple levels. We should also ask the question as whether an astronaut can ever really be trusted. If we can't rely on the words of characters or character of astronauts like Buzz Aldrin and Edgar Mitchell, as many researchers, including myself, have come to realise, um, why should we trust anything that Leonov says? There have been astronauts who have done some mild whistleblowing on a number of subjects, but this is quite a claim about Kubrick. No one has ever said anything to my knowledge before. And I should point out as well, I know some people do appreciate RT, um, but it's the only source of the interview, and I would say that it's important to realise that RT is effectively a limited hangout a platform for alternative news. There are numerous examples of disinformation being peddled on RT, so I think we have to treat it with a degree of caution. But despite all of that, in my research I did find out that the notion was there all along. I wanted to evidentially quantify when and where this connection began. I've continued to search, and I'm sure I will continue to research for a long time to come, um, but I have now established that the connection, the idea, was there pretty much right from the beginning, from Apollo 11. Bill Casing worked at Rocketdyne, a division of North American Aviation and later of Rockwell International from 1956 to 1963, where Saturn V rocket engines were built. And he was also the company's head of technical publications. He was also a tireless researcher of the moon hoax and for much of his life. And his most famous book is uh, We Never Went to the Moon, America's $30 million, uh, billion dollar, sorry, swindle first published in 1976, with several reprints from the late 80s and the early 90s onwards. Now, I was aware that this had been discussed in relation to casing, and again, uh, me being um, not entirely trustworthy of internet sources on this, I had a PDF version of it, but these things can be tampered with, so I went off and I looked, and eventually I managed to get hold of an original 1976 first edition paperback version of it. And it's there. He talks about it talks about the connection right from the beginning. So we can say that this consideration had been there right since 1976 when the book was published. This is what he says in the book. At the conclusion of chapter 3, Casey included a short section, page 28, entitled 2001, The Answer to Visual Aspects of Simulation. He says 2001, whilst 2001 was being filmed, Kubrick and his crew consulted nearly 70 industrial and aerospace corporations, universities, observatories, weather bureaus, laboratories and other institutions to ensure that the film would be technically accurate. Had this been done via the Apollo space program, without the cover of 2001, much suspicion would have been directed towards those making the inquiries. Another aspect of the release of 2001 in 1968 is this. The film prepared the American people for filmed versions of space exploration. It would be a simple transition from a huge manned orbiting lab gyrating to the strains of the Blue Danube in 2001 to the relatively prosaic view of two men taking a stroll on the moon. On page 62, he discussed this as a possibility that a complete set of the moon was built at an underground cavern. Every location that would be used for landing was created in exact detail. All scenes of the lunar excursion module, the LEM, were filmed on this set with the astronauts as stars, actors, characters. There were no more problems than would be appearing in any other production, like 2001, Star Trek, Silent Running, that sort of thing. After all, Hollywood grips and gaffers, cameramen and directors had acquired long experience in science fiction film production. A plus for the project was the advantage of filming silent. All voices and equipment sounds were dubbed by an elaborate sound creation and dubbing studio immediately adjacent to the moon set. And it's worth noting that Kubrick is one of a very small handful of uh, science fiction film directors who ever portrayed the exteriors of space in silence. And it was dramatically offset by the inclusion of music, but you don't hear. I, I think, I think um, it was Firefly, was it, a television series that did that as well, where you didn't hear anything of space? But there's not been many. There's not been many. Casing also noted the connection to Kubrick via the designer Ken Adam. Um, in the book, he discusses the Diamonds of Forever. 
So Don suddenly finds himself in a large room in which there is an authentic moon landscape lumbering around in their clumsy spacesuits are two would-be astronauts. Nothing happens, the scene is not explained, and the viewer is left to ponder its significance. Could it be? Yes, it could. Additionally, I've now verified that C Casing was researching this subject and the connection with Kubrick, you know, the, the possibility of Kubrick's connection. Uh, he was giving interviews on the subject. He was addressing the Kubrick connection as early as 1970. There are some audio interviews with him. Um, I have it on good authority that they do exist. I haven't been able to get hold of them yet, but I am in the process of getting them. I should point out this does not in any way constitute proof that Kubrick was involved with the moon hoax. But it does evidentially prove that barely a year after Apollo 11, the idea of a connection between the two had been considered and fully documented. One year, probably less than that. We may never know for certain if Kubrick was actually involved in the Apollo cover-up. But we now know that Kubrick's name has remained a source of connected speculation right from the very beginning. His name was there right from the outset. During the production of his films, Kubrick maintained a solid relationship with NASA. It's perfectly plausible that he may have been involved with the NASA cover-up, even if we lack the evidence to prove it. Even if he wasn't involved, it's perhaps more so plausible that he came into contact with those who knew more about him, gained access to the knowledge of the cover-up via other people. The Moon Apollo motif, and by extension NASA, does seem to be subtly embedded uh, in the symbolism of many of his films, and I will come to some of that in the second part of the talk. But perhaps it reflects what he knew rather than what he did. Maybe. I'll play devil's advocate on that one. Kubrick moved in rarefied circles and was subject to privileged knowledge. It may be that he was the recipient of a confession or two over the years throughout his life. If so, the knowledge that he gleaned did not end with the Apollo space program. An examination of his films revealed that he had a com complex grasp of the machinations of the global power elite, their beliefs and the covert methods of control. And that is what I'm going to have a look at in the second part of this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yes, by the way, before I finish, obviously, because I haven't discussed an awful lot about the actual uh, finer detail of the Apollo cover-up and uh, actual evidence to go off and look at. Obviously, you've got people who come here and do this, but I just wanted to give anybody who's not up on this subject some, just some good places to start on this one. The research of Mary Bennett and David Percy, particularly their book, uh, Dark Moon, uh, Apollo and the Whistleblowers, their documentary film, Whatever ha What Happened on the Moon, Jarrah White's 2009 documentary, Apollo Zero, James McCollier's, M. Collier's 1997 documentary, Was It Only a Paper Moon? Bart Sobrell's Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon. And Andrew Johnson is with us tonight, has done some great presentations on this subject. Particularly, I'm not just saying this because he's here, but if you check out the programs that he did with Richard, Apollo Conspiracy and Astronauts, Ask the Astronauts, they're great sources to look at if you're not familiar with this subject. So I'll see you in a bit. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.